So the section that we will be going over today is called, is about the core principles of parliamentary procedure. And the reason why this is important is that uh, if you understand the underlying principles, uh, but you can't remember the exact rule, you can at least get a feeling about what is right uh, by thinking about the core principles under which, uh, under, under which these rules are based. Um, so just uh, some organizational information about uh, this training. Uh, it's sponsored by the Cascadia E-Unit, which is a new virtual group um, organized within the National Association of Parliamentarians. And it's associated with the Oregon Association of Parliamentarians. Although we, uh, because it's a virtual group, we could take anyone from anywhere in the world and we would certainly welcome anyone from the Western United States. Uh, but if anyone would like to join us, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and the intention is to provide a way to study parliamentary procedure in Oregon outside of the Portland metro area, because our, our local problem is that there are three groups in Portland, but there's no groups in Bend or Jackson County or Wallowa County or Eugene um, that you can join with. And so driving that distance to get into Portland is kind of a stretch, but we can pretty much replicate the same experience using the internet and, and software technology like Zoom. And uh, so the membership options, uh, you can be a member and to become a member of the group, all you need to do is pass a quiz showing fundamental understanding and comprehension of parliamentary procedure and you become a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians or before you have passed the quiz, you can become a provisional member, uh, which allows you to attend meetings and vote and, and, and learn about this material from other parliamentarians uh, and then take the uh, and then you pass the quiz. Uh, there's a nominal fee for joining the group and then there are annual membership dues to the National Association of Parliamentarians but the president of the Oregon Association of Parliamentarians has offered scholarships to anyone uh, for which these fees are a barrier and I, Again, this is probably mostly available to people in Oregon, but uh, yeah, if, if you need financial help, uh, she will help us uh, uh, take care of those. Uh, any current member of the National Association of Parliamentarians can administer an exam, so I can do that. Uh, uh, there are some exams already scheduled in Portland on July 27th and August 31st, which has a uh, proctor arranged in a room, so if you uh, are in the Portland area or want to travel to the Portland area, you can join us on those dates. You will have to send your information in to get registered uh, very soon, probably no later than um, uh, July 20th um, for the July 27th uh, test. Um, but if you can't go to the, either one of those, we would be glad to make arrangements for you because we know where all of the members are in Oregon and there's someone within uh, within tra traveling distance of wherever you're at. Uh, to sign up, just go to the website pdpo.org. Um, there is now a membership page which has uh, an enrollment form for this group. So if you want to uh, enroll as a provisional member, you can fill out the form, send in your annual fees of $5, and you become a member of the Cascadia E-Unit, or you you can also uh, make arrangements for the exam. Uh, and then there's links also to the National Association of Parliamentarians and the Oregon Association of Parliamentarians. And on the next slide, on slide eight, I believe, or six, uh, are the two reference material guides. The yellow book, uh, Robert's Rules of Order in Brief, uh, allegedly contains all the information you need in order to pass the quiz to become a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians. And it'd be great if everyone at least nailed this material. Um, and then for the full book, uh, uh, it's called, the current edition is Robert's Rule of Order, 11th edition. I just found out yesterday that the uh, 12th edition comes out on September 8th. So unless you're really hot to study the book itself, uh, I'd recommend getting a used copy instead of a new copy of the 11th edition because it's going to soon be replaced uh, at the beginning of September with the 12th edition. So this segment is on principles underlying parliamentary law, and this is documented in the Robert's Rules of Order 11th edition on page uh, 
LI, which is 50, 51. Uh, for some reason, the uh, the preface of the book is numbered with Roman numerals. It's for fun, Larry. And and we, <laughs> it's and why not? It harkens to our our long history. Yes, <laughs> yes, something historical. Uh, just before we move on, just want to say hi, everybody. This is John Ellis, and uh, hi, Randy, who's in the audience right now. Those of you who are joining later because this is a live broadcast. Um, all, you can always ask questions, shoot them to info at uphillmedia.org, or you can hit Larry up at pdpo.org, join the membership. Um, those of you live, I'll be taking your questions in chat. So if you have any questions, post them there. And uh, thank you for joining us. Please share this so that we can get this message out. Larry, tell everybody why, before you get into this, just you know, a couple sentences, why is this information so important to progressives? Because we, we find ourselves... Um, in situations where we are outmaneuvered, uh, a, an example of this would be uh, in 2016 when the uh, establishment proposed a bylaws change uh, in the Democratic Party of Oregon. Bylaws changes are usually something that is thoughtfully done, uh, but they had this plan to uh, change the, the way in which we elected delegates to the state central committee that elected delegates to the Democratic National Committee, so that uh, the legacy delegates, that one, the ones holding over uh, from prior years, would be voting for the Democratic National Committee members, as opposed to the possible onrush of, you know, crazy progressives who wanted uh, people-oriented uh, governance. So they they asked for unanimous consent to consider a bylaws. And it was on a hot afternoon and it was late in the day and everyone just wanted to go home. And so there was one question about, isn't this kind of a big deal? And doesn't this affect a lot of things? And they were said, they were told, no, no, no. It's actually just a little tweak to the bylaws. And uh, it's okay if we just do this today. And no one objected because if even one person had said, I object, then they couldn't have proceeded with unanimous consent. And so then they went on to, uh, gloss over the Im the importance of the bylaws change in which they made. Uh, after it was all over, w we started looking back on what we had just done and the implications of what the change that we had made. And everyone was going, crap, they screwed us again because we were not on our toes. And so the the reason why we, we want to share these rules is so you can understand uh, what you can do to stop these things from at least getting considered properly. Um, in that instance, if they had objected, that we would have gone back to a scenario uh, where we, they would have proposed the exact language that they wanted to change in one meeting, and then you would have about three months in which to think about it, and then you can vote on it at the next meeting. Uh, and that's the way most bylaws changes should be made. In this, this instance, they were, they were passed the same day. No one had a chance to look through them, and it ended up affecting who we elected from Oregon uh, to be our Democratic National Committee members, you know, we only had three. We're not like California, which has, you know, a busload of delegates. So, you know, unless it was a close vote, it didn't have any effect uh, uh, on the ultimate out outcome. But this is why people in California and people in New York need to understand these these bylaws and how to how how to. Uh, navigate parliamentary procedure in the meeting so they don't make these kinds of errors. Thank you. It's it's power, folks. It's the power that we're supposed to have, and Larry's teaching us that power. And it's really boring stuff sometimes. But the truth is, is that when I hear people complain about the DNC rigging the elections, they can do that when they do crap like this in meetings, and we're not paying attention. So, all right. You know, and just a, a, a similar story in California, you know, we've heard that it's taking a long time to evolve the delegates in their state central committee just because the way the bylaws are structured, the election of delegates makes it very difficult. So when, when the Sanders group had their big influx uh, in 2017, they found out after it was all over that they only took over a third of the actual positions and that they had two thirds to go. Uh, and so they, you know, they were they were outvoted, and I don't know what the what the situation is down there now. I don't know, but we probably could have avoided that had we known the rules. So, awesome. Yep. Carry forth. So, uh, 
so these are the core principles of parliamentary procedure, and they date back to uh, the Magna Carta, uh, which was, you know, rich people taking away power from the the biggest rich person in England, which was the king. Uh, uh, and then, you know, those slowly evolved into what they use in Parliament, in the that, that House of Commons and the House of Lords. Uh, and it's those rules that were that were examined when our parliamentary procedures were set up for Congress back in the, uh, the late 1700s. Uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson was the vice president to George Washington, and he was the president of the Senate, and he had to develop rules of order. And so what Thomas Jefferson did was examine what Parliament did. And that's why we call them parliamentary procedures, because they're based on what they do in Parliament. Uh, and then these were adopted by uh, General Robert, who published these as Robert's Rules of Order back in about 1875. And this is what's become the, the most commonly used set of, of, of uh, meeting rules uh, in the United States and, and for many countries around the world. The, the National Association of Parliamentarians is actually an international organization. So these rules are based on, uh, on four groups of people, the, the rights of the majority, the rights of the minority, especially a strong minority, um, the rights of individual members, and the rate and the rights of people who were not able to attend the meeting. So, if you are a member of an assembly, uh, and that's someone who is recognized as a member, you have these these rights that are inherent to your membership. Um, the the this. Uh, another principle of, of parliamentary procedure is that the assembly decides who is empowered. So the overall membership of an organization establishes and empowers an effective leadership as it wishes, and at the same time retain exactly the degree of direct control over its affairs that it chooses to reserve for itself. Now, this being a mouthful, what this really translates into is the amount of power that an assembly uh, retains for itself versus what it uh, delegates to, say, the chair of the organization or the executive committee. Uh, a deliberative assembly, which is what we're talking about here, is not like a nonprofit organization or a corporation where you, you hire some visionary leader to come and take you to the next level of performance. The leadership in a, in a deliberative society is there to carry out the will of the people, and it's the will of the majority that determines how much you give to the executive committee. Uh, what we find is that um, the, the membership gets lax, and so you find leadership wanting to take power because it's, it's so much easier to decide things yourself as opposed to mess, messing around with democracy. And so rules are, are built into the bylaws that transfers power from the assembly to the executive committee, and uh, this is where you end up getting screwed because you, you know decisions start being made on your behalf. And they, and in the case where you have corporations running some of these organizations, the, the decisions are no longer on your behalf; they're on the decision they're on the behalf of those who are funding the organization. Not to name any names. <laughs> so I hope that's clear. And if I'm not being clear, you're more than welcome to uh, type into the chat and. That, ask me to explain things more clearly and John will relay them to me. Uh, I'll definitely um, know if, I, if it doesn't make any sense to me. I'll <laughs> let you know. That's, uh... um, another core concept of a del deliberative assembly is that you have free discussion. So following upon the opportunity for a deliberative process of full and free discussion, the majority decides the general will. Um, and it takes two thirds or more of those present and voting to deny any minority or a member the right of such discussion. So uh, we had a very interesting situation uh, when I was giving this material at the beginning of June. Uh, one of the members of a local group came up to me afterwards and asked a question, and well, we're going to get into that when I start talking about what the rights of individual members are. But you got to remember that uh, it's based on free discussion and majority rule. Um, and, and another core concept is changing a previous action. So as a protection against instability, the requirements for changing a previous action are greater than those for taking the action in the first place. 
So uh, in the discussion on the agenda, we talked about it taking a majority to change the agenda. So, you know, the process for an agenda is that the chair has a responsibility to to bring up all of the, the, uh, the items that need to be discussed. It has to be approved by the assembly as the way they're going to spend time. Changes when it's proposed it takes just a majority to change. But once they have approved the agenda, it takes a two-thirds vote to change it later in the meeting. 